seminar series. And this is our 10th, uh, I think, seminar. And again, as always, we want to acknowledge the support of the Department of Rural and Community Development, who we run the seminar in conjunction with the department. So it's great to be able to do this. It's great to be able to kind of get that rural research out there, rural issues, rural research, any kind of topical kind of agendas in relation to rural. That's exactly what we want to get out. So the University of Galway in conjunction with the department, this is what we aim to do. And um, we've kind of said at this stage, initially we had said the last Wednesday and every month, but we're kind of doing a little bit of chopping and changing because sometimes it might suit. But it definitely will be the last week of every month, even though our Wednesday, it may go to Tuesday, or Thursday. I think, um, yes, most definitely uh, the last week. But today we have uh, Susanna, Susanna von Munchhausen, and Susanna is an agricultural economist and she's working with Eberswald University. Uh, and she's an economist for applied science in the Northern Eastern Germany University of Eberswald. So she's the coordinator of the concluded liaison project that she's gonna talk about today. And that we're actually really looking forward to because um, it has uh, some connections, a lot of connections to the new premier project that we are a partner in in the University of Galway, in which we're delighted to partner with Suzanne and her team uh, in relation to that. But Suzanne contributes to the enhancement of co-innovation and the farmer-led development via her projects of sustainable solutions in agri-food sector. And she really is actively engaged in a wide range of practitioner networks. So she's an, a, a fantastic person, I think, to tell us really about this multi-actor approach that filters down through the EIP Agri projects that we have very strongly uh, within an Irish context at the moment. So on that sense, I'm delighted to welcome Susanna and uh, have her talk to us today about the liaison project and maybe even a little bit about the premier project towards the end. So thank you very much, Susanna. Thank you, Mara, for this very I'm, kind introduction. Great. I'm I very just high expectations, just so I hope I can fulfill them. Thank so, you very much. I just might get people to turn off their mics if they've got mics on. I might just get them to turn them off before Susanna starts. Thanks a million, Susanna. Yeah, no, no problem. So I excuse if I make any English mistakes. I'm not so used to talking in front of the native speaker community. However, I will do my very best. Normally we work in an in a European environment and they are always you find some people who um, are not native speakers. Anyway, unlocking the potential of working in partnership for innovation in agriculture, forestry and rural business. A few words from the Liaison Project, and I thank you again very much for this warm welcome and the invitation to present the results of the project today. A few words for the background. So this project, this Liaison Project, as the other European funded projects, sit under a policy background, and it is basically the societal challenges that need to be addressed by the European Green Deal or the Farm to Fork strategies, and these require innovative solutions. Co-creation for innovation implemented through co-creative partnerships, and that's what I will talk about, such as the funded multi-actor projects, is seen as a promising instrument to speed up innovation in farming, forestry, and rural business. So the full title is Better Rural Innovation, Linking Actors, Instruments and Policies Through Networks. Liaison. A few words about Liaison Project, then I will explain the database and the output that we've produced. And our main focus today is unlocking the potential and it will give you a few insights on our five how-to guys where we aim to help unlocking the potential. And then conclusion and outlook. Liaison was a research and innovation action. It was itself a multi-actor project consisting of 17 diverse organizations from 14 EU member states, including Switzerland and Norway and the UK. We started in May 2018 and finished in April last year. Budget was approximately 5 million euro 
And if you want to have a look what we've produced, here's the home page and follow us on Twitter. And we will work with this Twitter account even further and include all our findings on the premier project that um, Maura already announced. So the leading question actually for this liaison project was, why do some partnerships have the ability to organize themselves, to capture new ideas, to nurture them and create something new? And others do have major difficulties in doing so. So liaison aimed to understand better what makes a co-creative partnership for innovation really when it is successful. We aim to encourage more of these co-innovation partnerships and we developed recommendations for those providing the enabling environment for such partnerships, policy and administration. So where could we find co-innovation partnerships for learning more of good practices? That was the very initial question which we asked ourselves. So we went out and looked for certain types of projects, such as multi-actor projects in Horizon 2020 and nowadays Horizon Europe program, but also on the local level. And most of you will all know these kind of EIP agri projects in the rural development plans, which are called the operational groups. But there are also in other programs, such as Interreg, Life, Erasmus, or others. They are also in funded or non-funded local or regional networks or sectoral clusters, as well as in informal initiatives. So we were looking for various types of mixed groups of actors. However, they all had in common that they're working in a co-creative way, and this way doing what we call co-innovation or interactive innovation. So uh, many people talk about ACIS, Agricultural Knowledge and Innovation System. We all, as we sit here, are part of this. And in the liaison project, we really focused on the I, on the innovation, and within the innovation area, on the axis of interactive innovation. So there is in the large field of innovation, there's a lot of classical innovation going on where a research institute or a company is working on innovative solutions. However, we were interested in this interactive model of producing something new. How exactly do these group work together in order to produce an innovative solution? In order to show a little bit of what we found out there, we have said we would like to show a video, and this is the introducing video of Liaison. So we traveled across Europe and visited our 15 rural innovation ambassadors under the radar projects or initiatives. It was just before, uh, before COVID, so we were lucky. And, um, when we visited them, we realized, oh, it is so great to have the overview. We would like to prepare a video that really tells the story of how, uh, of what they have in common. And for that reason, I would like to share the video right now and we'll try to play it for everybody. In case it doesn't work, I will send you to the link, but let's see how it works. Is it okay? The European Rural Innovation Contest, the EURIC, was launched in January 2019. We wanted to find and award excellent examples of partnership for innovation. We were looking for farmers, foresters and agri-food initiatives with a story to share. These initiatives, these group, these powerful cooperations can inspire other ones as well, either in the near environment or abroad in other countries. This is the basic idea of our approach. We want to show what is out there, what is often overlooked. Rural innovation is currently one of the hottest topics of discussion from farmhouse kitchen tables to the EU Commission offices in Brussels. All across Europe, farming, 
forestry and agri-food initiatives are facing major social, economic and environmental challenges, as well as unprecedented opportunities. We want to make a contribution to finding and establishing solutions for the significant challenges farmers, foresters and we as a society are facing. Innovations are urgently needed and those innovations that are at hand need to spread more quickly within the area and across borders. We know that the exchange of knowledge and of practical experiences enhances innovation significantly. We also know that innovation solutions will be even more successful when people come together from different backgrounds, from different disciplines or from different professions. Lessons learned from the past show that coming together for joint problem solving and the co-creation of new ideas is much more successful and faster than when individuals, firms or research institutes set out to develop innovation by themselves. Our EU-funded liaison project aims to make a contribution to fostering cooperation and co-creation and help to improve the dynamics in these mixed groups of innovators with a special focus on farmers, foresters and associated rural businesses. It is not easy to organize and to manage joint efforts for innovation. For that reason, European and national research and innovation programs aim to enhance such types of joint innovation in land use industries. With our European Rural Innovation Contest, the EURIC, we set out to discover examples of cooperation and co-creation from all rural areas of Europe. The EURIC especially aimed to seek out innovative, inspiring and groundbreaking initiatives that were not so well known or visible. We were looking for excellent examples of innovation in products, processes or services in the agri-food or forestry sectors that we could learn from. But what they all have in common, they were able to realise their ideas because they worked together. We have found small and big groups, groups with researchers, teachers or advisors, with entrepreneurs from processing or retail businesses, or with persons engaged in nature conservation. Sometimes consumers are involved as well. However, farmers and foresters are always in the centre of the innovation group. We identified and selected groups because of their achievements and experiences in organising the mixed team of people successfully. These achievements are often overlooked because they are so difficult to see from the outside. We aim to recognize them and acknowledge their achievements as a group. We call them Rural Innovation Ambassadors because they stand for a large but unknown number of cooperating innovators throughout Europe. When you talk to them, you hear from new energies and fresh ideas and encouragement that grew with the joint effort. They tell you that the emerging solution or innovative business model is much more than the sum of the individual contributions from each partner. Their journey often started with the crazy idea and then they encountered peaks and valleys, but in the end they reached great milestones. We did the same when we visited them. We departed on an exciting journey from east to west, from north to south and to the centre of Europe. Our journey to meet and film the Rural Innovation Ambassadors was a bit like the endeavour of the innovation groups. Terrific outlooks, great people to meet, but long ways between. And it does not end because there is so much more inspiring collaboration for innovation out there. Okay, now we're back. I'll continue with my presentation. Here we go. We've saw we've seen the <clears throat> this journey video, and there are 15 more rural ambassador videos. A few words on Liaison's own co-innovation partnership, because we also wanted to be a good multi-actor project. So our 17 partners came from research, education, farm advice, 
policy and other consultancy. We set up an ethics committee that was looking after GDPR and gender, but it was also helping with mediation in, came, in case of some conflicts were coming up. We had a particular work package on how we work together and a project advisory group of mixed actors also. Moreover, we had four stakeholder groups from across Europe that we encountered several times during the lifetime of the project. A few more words for how we work together, because this is really something which I would recommend to include also in new projects. Um, at an early stage, um, we had a co-design workshop on our communication and expected collaboration. Everybody could speak up and say what are the expectations are and which rules should be set up. And later on in the project, we could refer to them. We had an annual self-reflection on our own co-innovation and participatory learning process. This was quite important in order to ensure awareness of the co-innovation challenges, which also fed into our findings later on. And it was also a critical assessment of our own cooperation and if needed to improve it. So this exercise was basically an ongoing awareness raising and a critical reflection. Apart from our own experience, and that is very well shown by the URIC and the video which we saw, is we went out and looked for a database in order to have good evidence base for our analysis and later on the output. So apart from these under the radar, um, networks and initiatives, which we were looking for from the URIC, we also went to the official databases and looked for projects such as operational groups, multi-actor projects funded under Horizon, LEADER, and all the other ones which I mentioned before. From those, we had a light touch review with 200 case studies. And based on those, we selected 30 European ones for the in-depth analysis. And in addition, we choose some from the ambassadors also in order to have this non-funded under the radar perspective also. In uh, all together, we had 32 case studies because two of them were interna international case studies, one from Africa and the other one from Canada. We produced several reports and scientific papers, as well as 45 practice abstracts. And this is how we displayed our good practices from the URIC. It's a map that you find on our homepage. We had 175 entries, and for each of these, there's a very short profile, which you can find when you click on it. From those, we selected 15, and um, our Irish ambassador was the Hemp Cooperative, which we awarded at an event in the end of 2019 at Brussels. And if you wish, you can have a look at this video. Shane will post the link later on. It's a little bit too long, otherwise we would have shown it now immediately. But after the end of this session, you're more than welcome to have a look at it. We produced 32 posters for the highlights of the in-depth case studies, which are also available from our homepage. But the most important for today is a deeper look into our how-to guides for practice. We have produced five of them. They are translated in five, six, seven languages, actually. Um, and they, ha they have the following titles. Coming together, good planning, healthy partnership, connected partnership, and achieving impact. And I will go through these different areas. They are not really conse consecutive if it goes into the innovation process, they overlap also. However, we found it helps very much to group them like this in order to develop um, recommendations based on them. And what we found for coming together is actually the exploring at the beginning of the co-innovation process is very, very strongly linked to getting the right people together or the right organizations. So it's about bringing together complementary knowledge. It's not only about 
bringing together the best trends, but really those who can contribute to the particular solution that the group aims for. New ideas and project proposals often build on previous projects to test previous results or to bring them to practical maturity. It is not uncommon that partnerships last beyond the lifetime of the individual project and then feed into the next one. Maybe new partners add in order to fulfill the requirement of the complementary knowledge. And what we've also seen is that EU funded these large scale projects and local projects are often linked via research organizations or large advisory players. So if people from the local level look for connections into the European, they often go via larger players on the national level. So the second on good planning. This presents tips and tricks for planning of core innovation projects. And the cartoon at the right hand side is probably not what is to be done. Because in these projects, it's not really different from the school situation. If there's somebody standing and explaining, others switch off in case they are not involved. So that can be done better. Partnerships depend on a solid foundation for their future collaboration. And that's exactly what needs to be built in this planning process. They need to develop a shared vision, establish clear governance structures and define shared responsibilities. And leaders are aiming to foster trust and good communication, plan ahead for the regular monitoring and evaluation of both the group's interactivity and the innovative solution they are working on. So it's always on these two dimensions. Look after the dynamics of the group, the core innovation, involvement of everybody, and what we are doing actually. Are we producing hemp? Are we setting up a new marketing scheme or something like that? And then the project is funded. So what about the healthy partnership actually? And again, this picture of two girls chatting and the other ones feeling excluded represents a situation that is very, very quickly produced and emerging in a project that some of the partners feel excluded because others build the core group, make decisions. So creative and productive groups promote an open communication and close, close cooperation between their members. Well-working for innovation groups value the diversity of their members, establish a culture of how to deal with failure, because failure is part of it. It's the valleys the video was talking about, and we've all experienced these valleys of failures. They are normal, but it's important to set up a culture in advance of how to deal with it. And this will allow the groups to address conflictual situations early. And this can only be done when sufficient flexibility and adaptive capacity is there on both sides, the coordinator, as well as the participants or the party the conflict has emerged from. So healthy partnerships are aiming to ensure transparency and trust. And trust is actually something all these groups want to have, but it is not established by just switch on um, the whatever. It needs to grow on these aspects, which I mentioned before and others also. Connected partnerships. So that's the dimension of these groups, which are embedded in a wider context where innovation takes place. The networks they are coming from and the networks they are feeding their knowledge and their results into it. So this, I thought, is a good cartoon, actually, that represents this connection, this embeddedness, and this often tiring and energy-taking connection with the outside. Hi, I'm a user, happy to give feedback about your product. Wow, a user. Oh, what do we do? Rather run away. Hurry, call the user researcher, let somebody else deal with it. We all probably know this feeling, but that's not the way of doing it. We need to face the outside, the critical voices out there. Feedback is sometimes unpleasant. It doesn't help. We need to incorporate it. So that's what connected partnerships is about. 
achieving impact. How effective is the group's co-innovation process actually? Is the collaboration going as planned? How then can the group report on the progress of the project and assess its likely impact? Or do the leaders do as here in this cartoon, let's keep going, close the eyes, no ears, let's just move on and finish the project. We need to stick to our dead, uh, deadlines. Probably not the way to do it in the multi-actor co-creation process. So this guide, Achieving Impact, outlines the benefits of a clear, detailed, and well-planned self-assessment and impact evaluation strategy. And it shows how groups can embed evaluation into their work and measure and assess their successes. Conclusion. The EIP Agri policy concept, which was the one that the project was embedded in, has changed a lot since 2013. It was aiming to speed up innovation in agriculture, forestry and rural business in EU member states. But the implementation remained challenging. Cooperation between different types of partners is difficult and the different speeds of providing the best suitable enabling environment in Europe's rural areas is another challenge. So if we look onto Ireland or Germany, it's very much different to what we encounter in Bulgaria, Romania or Cyprus. And we need to take this into account if we don't want to fall into a part. We in the Western part, we cannot dwell on our experiences and our long lasting way of working together um, in, in our long tradition of cooperation and cooperatives, we need to somehow take into account the rest of Europe since we sit in the same boat. So liaison shows that co-creation for innovation within mixed group of actors remains a complex task within the country, across the countries and in certain areas in particular. And it is important to keep an eye on this complexity of the competences of the actors involved, as well as their capacities. So I would like to stop here for a second or for a longer time and allow for questions or discussion points before I go into the outlook. Any immediate reactions or have I overwhelmed you with the, the output of the project? I think we can we can take either questions that are coming in via the chat or, or if somebody wants to jump in, you're welcome to do that as well. Nothing on the chat, yes, Maura. I think people are just yeah. engrossed in what you're saying, Suzanne, actually, at the moment. Yeah. I suppose, Suzanne, one of our big... Okay, Daniel is um, raising the hand. Danny Galvin here. That's great. Thanks a million. Hi, how are you? Um... It, it would seem that there's an awful lot of cooperation. Um, I see our own group here. There's great people uh, put together, but it seems that there's a, there's an awful lot of cooperation needed. I, I think we have something like 30 ideas for an EIP here, and we know they're all fabulous, but we've got to bring them down to a very, very small amount. Uh, what would your advice be there? In order to what to set up new projects or what's your yes. question? Yes. Yeah, I mean, the new period, the new funding period will start now in 2003. And um, money is set up. So um, I think it's a great opportunity. It is not the best one for all questions. As I mentioned, the classical innovation where research teams or yeah, organizations such as companies need to work on, on key results that will still continue. But yes, try to get there. Try to get into this kind of funding if possible. Um, and what I would recommend is really to look somebody who has experience in leading these groups because you need a certain expertise and a certain mindset also in coordinating such projects. And I mean, this come, came through to my, through my, um, my cartoons a little bit, 
um, because what we've seen, and I just gave a presentation, uh, presentation before Christmas because a innovation service in Germany was asking me, they had a meeting with their um, EIP agri project coordinators and said, well, um, Susanna, I would like you to speak about the healthy partnerships because me as an innovation support service lady, I realize there is a lot of improvement possible. We still have the old fashioned way of running these projects. From research side, from applied research side, from education, from advisors. So the mindset is still very much onto, this is the plan, I'm the boss, and it's how we go. And if you have kind of uh, smaller partners, smaller consultants or farmers in there, those who are not used to have a say in these larger teams um, are often the silent ones, don't have a say. For that reason, you need measures, you need instruments, you need methods, participatory methods in order to make them speak, to involve them. And even if they speak a different language, that needs to be included. So I think the thing that, um, that, that there is still a lot to be learned. And maybe if you go out there and have yeah an idea for a corporation, um, it's really crucial to find the right coordinator who encompasses all these needs and has the flexibility and has the mindset to be open for failure, to be open for criticism. I received a lot of criticism, for example. And if I was, let's say, 25 years younger, not yet have family and problems in partnership and all what we encounter, if we get over 50, I probably would have been a weaker coordinator. Um, so bear with those who are not yet there. And um, yeah, may maybe that's a bit my recommendation. Does that okay. answer your question? Thank you. Thanks, Susanna. I think we have a couple more. Liam, I think, is wants to come in there. And we have a question from Deirdre as well online. Uh, hello, Susanna. And hello. Sorry, first of all, I apologize. I never heard about this Zoom till uh, yesterday. So first of all, I want to apologize from my side of it. And also, I've been I've been tracking EIP since, since the last one because we missed out the last time. So and we've never heard of you. So there's a lack in there how EAPs actually gets into the rural communities to get me. And like and like we've been doing like trying to do an EIP without funding, and that's not easy, Suzanne. To get me, as you know, I and know, I know. Yes, yes, and and basically, like our EAP is based on water, and that's essential for all all, all life. To get me, as you know, and like I said, it's like I said, them partners that you that you refer to, they, they, we should be brought into a room to get me in the regions so so that we can actually identify them. To get me, because like. The local community has its own ecosystem. So I only have to come into here. This is my first time on a Zoom meeting with yourselves to get me. And it's really ex explaining what's going on. But that information is not trickling down to rural Ireland as yeah. it should be. To get me. Because I, I was at the Just Transition thing last year. I should know about your Zooms and I should be on the Zooms following what's going on to get me. And mm -hmm. this, this is the first time I've heard about this this, this meeting and about Galway being involved. So there is an information gap there of a huge because if the communities don't hear about it, they can't interact. And yeah. there's only 55 EIPs, is it last year, the last time round to get me? So there isn't a whole pile to get me. And like that man, he said, right, a lot of ideas, who's going to coordinate it to get me to know? And it takes a certain expertise. And, and like certain areas might have that expertise, rural Ireland mightn't have that expertise. So the dish don't get an EIP, is that, that's not, like it should be a fair, that the stakeholders in the region should be brought together, i.e. the councils, like so the people that have, have the expertise and bring them into the local area and say, yeah, we'll work on this together with you. Sorry, no, I'll let you go at that. Thank you. Well, thanks, Liam. Thanks for that. And um, there's want another- like just this, uh, Mara, directly because yes. it's local level and I can confirm, Liam, we've got the same in Germany. There's a certain community who is in there, who knows what's going on. And then you talk to even larger, well, not, not, the, not the under the radar and, and ignoring farmers' community, but the other ones also who haven't heard of it and haven't been involved yet. Maura, maybe you want to respond to that. Um, yes, um, Liam, absolutely. And I suppose in relation to the National Rural Network as well, there was a fairly big conference in Athlone there just before Christmas. So again, we tried to bring an awful lot of the 
um, current operational groups together in the one area. So some of them were speaking, some of them, um, the idea was to suggest, I suppose, how they would have come together, the challenges. So again, maybe if you can look up the National Rural Network site as well. I, I'm sorry, I, I was there, I was, at, I was at the conference. Oh good, oh good, I, yeah, I, yeah. I actually had to stand outside the door, so we were there, but I never heard about yourselves at the, to get me, so what I'm saying is you've, you've had okay. what? So, so what I'm saying is that information, because like we are a serious e EIP potential, yeah, and we'd, yeah. we'd love to link with yourselves, but like that link has to be, because I've gone to the meetings, I've been in Tullamore at the Just Transition as well, so, and that's happening here, so that, that conversation and the EIP should be all out there to get me. So I, I did the conference, I took time off, we had a stall there and everything, we were outside the door at the conference. Great, great, yeah. yeah you've, you've probably seen our presentation as you walked, were you, were you yeah. at the conference? Yeah, yeah so I was, I was seen, indeed, yeah. Yeah, I was yeah indeed. So you've probably seen our presentation outside the door, so what I'm saying is, Rural Ireland needs that link, and Irish Rural Link is doing a great job. Like what I'm saying is that, but like to link in with the stakeholders, the, the other stakeholders yeah. outside the, the EIP. Thanks. Uh, absolutely, Liam. Absolutely, Deirdre. I think had a comment in there as well. I think Deirdre McDermott. Um, I see you, John, as well. We'll come to you, John, in a second. I see. You. Thank you, Deirdre. Do you want to jump in, or do you want us to read it out, Deirdre? Well, it's fine. I mean, I think in a way, um, Liam has 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 broach much the same thing in fact um it's just you know when you when you do live on you know online as we've all had to over the years you click on a link in something that interests you and suddenly um it, you know you end up on on networks without having a clue how you got there um or reading source material you know it's it's all quite confusing because you don't have the aids to memory that you do when you're actually physically somewhere. Um, so, you yeah, know, I, I, um, Shane has answered me in the chat, um, explained how I might have got here anyway through the Rural Voices uh, Network. So anyway, it's very good to see you all and um, to have this opportunity to listen in and hear what's going on. Thank you. Great, Deirdre, thanks a million for that. Then I'm not sure if you want to come in on that. Or do you want to take a question from John? There is yeah, waiting patiently. Um, I'm we're waiting patiently. I'm I'm fascinated because this is a reality coming to my mind. I'm there's a couple of words that, re, that that I have impressed and impressive. Right now, I've I've uh, had fault over the last number of years with the the regional development policy. Right, that to my mind we don't have the geographic or the demographic areas to do this, but where we have where we have a great tradition is on a local basis. And I've been fighting for the idea that we should be looking at a county basis where we have a network of local community clusters that can feed into that information, right? Because one of the annoying things that I see when I'm, I'm going through the various um, projects in the EU is I can see a project and say, gee, that could work here. And nobody seems to have it. And, you know, I think we're losing out. We, I know we are losing out on some of the potential. But if we go back to the roots, if we go back to the idea of the Mehel and we have, say, a county network, people have an empathy with that. They have a supportive nature with that. And I think that's something, and I know that's something we should be looking at again, to be more effective on the ground, that we can share information because there are talents, there are more and more talents out there in rural Ireland that we can that we can actually visualize. That's where we should go. Rural community um, networks. Absolutely, Thank John. You. I think that's exactly what Suzanne is trying to promote. Yeah. This kind of cooperation. Um, Suzanne, I think you'd agree with that. That kind of collaboration, that cooperation, is exactly what um, yeah. operational groups are, are are all about. Yeah, maybe maybe I can add to that because John actually. Um, touched upon a very important point, which is the ongoing networks. So the ongoing seed beds for whatever comes up. And this is from what we found in the liaison project is actually something that is often overlooked because there is no funding for it. What we actually need much more is these ongoing networks like machinery rings or breeding associations and so on. These are the networks that need to be maintained and are often organized by themselves more or less professionally. We all know them. Some work very well. Others yeah, have their problems, have their valleys over a certain time because the leading person doesn't do it anymore for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And it is actually these kind of 
ongoing networks. And that's the difference between the project and the network. The project has a start and an end and has a certain work plan. And it is set up to solve a certain problem or work area that it is in. But it doesn't come from the nothing. It comes out of a seedbed, of a network, exactly as you were saying. And what I also am encountering, because I'm part of an organic network here in my area, and we are trying to establish an alignment of forces with nature conservation, organic farmers, and all the food initiatives, how to fund the ongoing work that is needed for the running of such a network. You need to set up the meetings, you need to the minutes, you need to cheer up the people. It's an ongoing work by itself just to have a management of these networks. And that is something where this system is still weak and the funding system is still weak because this, what we call institutionalized funding, this ongoing funding is something that is not foreseen for the private sector because you can see taxpayers' money can be easily misused for whatever club is continuously funded. We don't want to have, see this. But on the other side, we need a continuous funding of exactly where these innovative groups come from, the breeders' associations, the cooperatives, like the one that we've identified from, from the hemp cooperatives, this ongoing work. And only based on those, these new ideas, as Liam mentioned, as John mentioned, will be able to emerge and thrive. And then disappear again in them. Yeah, yeah absolutely, Susanna. And, and I think that is one of the areas that we, I suppose, have to consider here in Ireland. Um, EIP agri-operational groups are something very new within the Irish context as they are across Europe. And I think in some ways within the universities, we're very used to getting projects, having them funded, having a beginning date and an end date. And I suppose we had some fantastic projects in Ireland. But what, what you have said is very interesting. What is really important here is the establishment of the network. The project will have an end date. It will come to an end, but the network does not need to come to an end. And I think, Liam, that's exactly what you were talking about in Deirdre as well. That, that forming of that network is much bigger than the project itself. The forming of the network really is what's important. And the forming of the network is what will get the next project and the next funding. And I think that's what's really important. I'm just conscious, Suzanne, that you have more of a presentation. So I, have only, I only need five minutes because that's the yeah. outlook of our premier project. I did. I. That's fine. We can move on with the questions. OK, OK, that's good. That's good. Okay. Sorry, can Liam, I just... if you want to come back in there. Yeah. Sorry, it's, you're you're dead right. It's the link that I'm going to make 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 with Galway or whoever. It's that link that's going to last because the the funding will come and go on the project, but it's the link that we make with with Galway University. Uh, that's what that's that's what, that's the real brick that will build another brick, and you're on the money. And that link needs to be ground in. And I'd love to get your number after this. Sorry, no. And John, you're dead right. Bring it back to the counties, and uh, but but have it shared in the communities. This man, you're on the money. Thank you very much. Can I, Thanks, can, I, Liam. can I just pop in there with a comment from Tom Strong, um, maybe for you, Suzanne, that we need to develop better food production systems and can you support ground up projects that challenge conventional thinking? Can I just add my contribution to this? Well, can we just get a response we, for Suzanne on this one? Maybe Suzanne, first? Yeah. John, one second. Back to you, second, John. Thomas well, there. yeah, yeah. It is not only about agriculture, it is foreseen that the food system overall will be integrated in this kind of funding. However, as we know, the funding of, um, of non-agriculture, non-primary business is a bit more tricky, so you might need higher um, co-funding proportions, so that's a bit tricky. But actually, that's exactly what we need. We need to have integrative approaches where we have the farming linked to these food initiatives in order to change yeah food also so but the problem is i can see clearly here is the silos of the funding systems um so food is often funding under more the innovation or the um, european social fund or something related to schools or education or sports or so and we lack this connection. It has been always discussed to integrate these different European programs, the co-funding programs more, but then it sits in the national level in different 
ministries. So we have responsibilities in ministry for commerce, ministry for um, social affairs, and then we have the agricultural side. So I think this is another requirement uh, which we can highlight again and again to the ministries and to the county level is this integration of different programs. And when it comes to the food and the processing and so on, and public procurements for schools and, um, and canteens, this is definitely something that needs to be linked because the production comes from the area around it. And we've got the producers, we've got your farmers, you, who should go and link with these food initiatives, public or private. And there's actually a gap of funding also. In principle, to answer your question, GE by EIP Agri is open for the value chain. However, it is not that straightforward with the money flow. Does that answer your question? Thanks, Susanna. Daniel uh, has a good uh, comment there in relation to wider digital age problem. Daniel, do you want to come in on that or will we? Happy for you to come in if you want to. Hello, hello, how are you? Daniel, hi. How are you doing? I uh, know, I was just saying uh, about uh, obviously connectivity. Uh, one of the issues you've got is uh, at the moment is there is so much discourse and um, projects going on across Europe and elsewhere that it's really difficult to keep a tab of everything. Um, so that was just my comment. Um, and I think it's in part because of the digitization of the sector during the pandemic. Um, but I'm sure people could comment on that more than me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Daniel. I suppose it's something that we face ourselves all of the time in Galway. You know, um, we had a meeting last week with another project and we went to Brussels. Susanna's involved in this project as well. But we have we have a new Falara project, which is looking at female innovation in agriculture and rural areas. So innovative led um, projects by women in rural areas and in agriculture. And Susanna was there as well. And I think it was, we already had held an online meeting, but I think it was until we actually got face to face. And even though it cost money and time and energy, um, that face to face me meeting really gelled ideas and connectivity between the group itself. And uh, until that actually happens, it's kind of difficult. So from, I suppose, an Irish perspective, those EIP Agri operational groups at the moment, it's difficult to bring that gelling together until people can actually try and come together face to face as well. Digital is great once you're up and running maybe and set up, but the initial coming together sometimes means that a face to face meeting can be really important. The other thing that it was in Suzanne's presentation at the beginning was about the importance of these projects having a life after the project. And I think that links very well to the questions that are coming up here from Deirdre and from Liam. It is that we end up in about 50 different links and 50 different WhatsApp groups. And maybe it is time that we look to see how we build networks into existing networks so that we do end up becoming you know, it's probably a small community of people that's involved in different projects. But so then you be, you know, we've a very start this small role of voices at the beginning. And here we are with however many online. I know Shane, we have over 300 contacts um from this. So there is a gap for it. But so I think we need to get creative onto how people with similar interests can stay linked together. Yeah, most certainly, Louise. And just to note, and I did add an explanation as to, for those of you not familiar with Rural Voices, how it came about and also what we intend to achieve. You know, it's about a year in operation now, but essentially we cover a different topic every month. So it's not always agri innovation. We've covered the value of rural festivals next month. Uh, just to announce that it'll be on rural transport and various projects in that area. So just take note of that, um, that but this is continually evolving. Uh, we're trying to get the word out there. And um, yeah, that, that's the context. Back to you, Suzanne. I know you have to finish your presentation. So we well, John is waiting so patiently. OK. John, you want to come in there again? Perfect. Just, like, just slightly. Um, the biggest problem we have with small groups is leadership and some sort of a framework. And I have come up with it with a format that can work in some cases. And essentially what we need to do is we need to get the objective sorted out, the structure, the strategy, and uh, I suppose the budget. And if people kind of fill in those, those, those lines, it gives them a foundation to move forward initially, right? They then have a framework because the biggest problem we have is getting that leadership together initially, right? And the other thing I'd say, and then I'll be quiet, 
don't forget we have a young generation coming up here that are very, very able, they're vocal and articulate and whatever, and they should be involved with any or all projects that we're looking at. Thank you. Yes, absolutely, John. Thanks a million for that. Um, getting them involved sometimes is often, uh, um, you know, the challenge, I suppose. But uh, once you overcome that challenge, it's unbelievable how um, important they can be to projects. But I think a lot of the new sustainability projects, a lot of the operational groups on the ground have quite a lot of young people involved. And I think, again, I suppose just to, to kind of say that maybe come around the middle of the year, uh, 2023 there will be a call out via the department of agriculture for new eip agri operational groups but also i suppose sometimes the operational groups are quite a, a, a bigger order of a project that we need to get here in ireland sometimes coming together under leader funding can also be uh, something that could be a starter point for an eip agri project so i suppose don't maybe overlook the idea of leader funding either and bringing a community group together in under leader funding and again, I suppose once the operational groups are up and running, and we have quite a number of them here in Ireland, again, getting those operational groups to continue that network that Suzanne was talking about, and maybe look towards the European funding of Horizon Europe at the moment. So I suppose that continuity of networking is really important. There is funding out there, I suppose it's just to kind of get attached to that funding. And Suzanne, we might bring you back in again. Yeah, thanks a lot. I've set up already my next slide. Liaison is finished. What's next? Preparing multi-actor projects in a co-creative way. The premier project is a Horizon Europe coordination and support action that started in January. And it's also as the liaison project coordinated by our Eberswalde team. Curtain up. Premiere will contribute to having project consortia that ensure best use of the complementary knowledge of their members during proposal writing. And since proposal writing is so important, it impacts on the project work and even beyond, as we've just discussed. So Premiere also is a multi-actor project. We have 15 partners. One of them is the Galway team and the, from 12 EU member states. We started now in January and it will go on for five years. It's about 5 million and we will move on with the Twitter account but change the name. So this is just for the overview. Premier members and the macro regional hubs. So we see Ireland and um, Newark uh, University for Gal of Galway is responsible for leading this macro regional hub, this larger network. And maybe Maura just comes into my mind. This is an opportunity to actually um, set the yeah that's a starting point for this integration of the different networks because this macro regional hub is exactly about these linkages. Um, we've got other partners in the other areas who are leading here. They are underlined and in bold, and we are aiming to cover, even though our budget is limited and we've got partners in only limited countries, we try to cover the different areas of the European Union as good as we can. Highlights of Premiere, we will engage in brokerage for new calls for multi-actor projects on the European level. So it's all about the phase of the preparation. It's all about what I've explained before under the coming together and good planning how-to guide. We will also test seed funding and support operational group organizations to go Horizon Europe. So that's exactly the outlook that Maura gave us in her last statement. We will celebrate new multi-actor projects at granting parties give support and at the same time learn for them. But again, in this project, we need good practice examples and understand a bit better what makes a good writing process. Develop a serious game, an online academy and a MOOC. We will prepare videos, creative visuals, and a set of additional how-to guides. We will offer training for trainers and foster actors' capacity for multi-actor co-creation. Thank you for your attention.
And if you have contact, uh, questions, you can ask me or contact Jane, who is in charge for Ireland. And as we've seen, for the northwestern area of Europe. Any questions for that? Geraldine, I think, is coming in there. Geraldine Behan. I am indeed. Yeah. Hi. Thank you very much, Maura. And thank you, Suzanne, for your presentation. Um, my name is Geraldine Behan. I'm with the um, EIP section in the Department of Agriculture. I work on the operational side, so supporting the operational groups, processing payments, that kind of thing. And I'm curious, Suzanne, did anything come out of your studies? Was there any data around, how should I put this, the, the optimum the optimum funding model w for groups like this between administration costs and implementation costs. It's a question that, that comes up very often. Obviously, you're talking about taxpayers' money for most of these projects. Everybody wants to, to see, you know, the, the most bang for the buck. Everybody likes to see a lot being spent on implementation. Um, a lot of the groups that we're working with are making payments to farmers. So everybody wants to know about the farmers' payments. And even yesterday, we, we had a query from our own internal audit unit about, you know, the proportion of spending on uh, between admin and farmer payments on yeah, groups. Yeah, I get your point. I get your point. Yeah. Get Is your there point. any data that's come, come out of anything you've been looking at? Or I know it wasn't specifically a focus. Yeah, no, there. since we, no, unfortunately not, since we haven't been uh, collecting the data on the, on the administrative side. I mean, this is mm -hmm. behind curtains for us. I, yeah. I, I know these kind of discussions are going on mm -hmm. and I think it's a valid point to discuss and what we've seen on the European level is actually that the project get bigger although the requests from the grassroots level is to make them more handable to fund even on the European level maybe project of 200 or 300 thousand euros mm -hmm. that will never be possible on the European level because administrative costs will be too big so what we've yeah. seen is actually projects grew bigger We've seen several calls for, I don't know, 10 million or even 15 or 20 million. I saw a project presentation today. From the local level, and that was your basic question, best question I, um, we've got in Germany um, 200, 250,000 as a limit for these groups to be handled by the farmers union or by the local cooperative or by an advisory service or something like that. I know that you had in Ireland bigger ones like those that mm -hmm. focused on agri-environmental schemes and so on. Mm -hmm. And I would answer your question as follows. Um, from the perspective of the administrative body, if you want to set up larger ones, then you have to think in programs. And that's what we've actually seen also in the EIP level. Um, uh, is can you move Sorry, Suzanne, we might have some mics on. Yeah, I'm, I'm, go, I'm actually, I'm going to mute my... Yeah, you mute yourself. Yeah, okay, because you've got background. Behind. So even with these multi-actor projects, these last one on European level, some of them are structured like research programs with subordinated work going on. And I think that'll be the challenge for the future. If you want to reduce administrative costs, you handle actually over the large bulk of cost of, of budget into a project, but the project itself will be run like a program and expected to be a program in order with the re requirement to set up multi actor projects. And that would then, if you say we want to have some work going on on climate mitigation, for example, and then we set off something for 5 million and say, well, however, you get these 5 million, but please present a, pro a, a project plan that allows for the distribution into smaller local level projects. And I think there is some, some lessons to be learned. Administratively, it's not 100% easy, but that's the way to go, I think, if the organizations itself, the funding authorities or the granting authorities are not able to fund these smaller size uh, projects anymore. So this is the only solution I, I could see. And that was also allow us to somehow set up the networking somehow level, which we've discussed earlier. If we have a project going on for five or seven years, um, then say, okay, and you will run 
I don't know, 10 smaller projects, supervise them and administer the money for them. But that hasn't been developed more in detail and because it, it needs administrative design, no. which is probably not straightforward. I think what's, what's happened slightly organically under our own EIP agri um, system here the, the the various rounds of open calls that we've had under the world development program was that operational groups were set up to run one EIP project and then they applied to run on another one and another one and I think we have one operational group is running three projects and, and a number that are running two so you have some economies of scale I suppose you could you could say in that so it's, it's effectively what you're talking about but it, it's happened sort of our, organically as the program went along thanks for that Geraldine thank you, thank you very much That's it. thanks a million Geraldine um, Liam very quickly if we can get you in because we, we do like to finish fairly well on time if we can <clears throat> Liam, you're, you're on silent. Hello. Yes, fairly yes. quickly there if you can. Yeah, we might. Sorry, yeah. We've linked with Google on, an, on a VR platform in the environment and we, it's Kairos and Torlux. And that would be ideal for Galway University because the, the, the Torlux region really starts on this side of Shannon, the whole way down. And we want to do an EIP on that. So we'd love Galway, you have the expertise, we, we have the creativity here. We'd love to be with Galway on, on an EIP in that in that format. To get me and like I said, that expertise. You're right. That's what we're we're, we're lacking. So if, if if can be some transfer, how we can get back to yourself there on this on that point. To get me so sorry now. And, and it's been nope. a thank, nope. you, thank you very much, Thanks a lot for that, Liam. Very quickly to Martha, maybe just before we finish. Hi. Uh, um, look, I'm. I'm a member of a small uh, community group in West Kerry. We've been working away on our own um, initiative, getting little bits of funding ourselves and, you know, doing our best to protect our dune system. And there are like qualifying interests. Uh, we've often looked at EIPs. I just like to make an observation, though, and it's not meant to be a criticism of any of this, because I think it's amazing listening to Suzanne. I think the whole thing is so complicated for community groups to get their head around without an academic. Let's say, a lot of the EIPs from what I can see in Ireland are one or originating from NPWS staff who have a research interest in, in a habitat or, 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 or a species. And, and from my perspective, um, I think, well, I feel our group is totally missing out all the time because we look at it like this far off thing that's impossible to attain uh, without some you know, guiding person to get through it. So we've just kept going on our own. But I, I would suppose I would, I would ask the people making the calls on these funds to think about the community groups that really have no idea how to start any of this. Look for a consultancy. Maybe they can help because they can apply for money also for the coordination work. Yeah. And I suppose, again, I suppose reaching out to um, the universities, to the Institutes of Technology, there's quite a lot of interest there as well of people coming on board for these. And I think there was quite a lot of a collaboration. Now, I was involved myself in the evaluation the first time round. And I have to say there was a great mix of community coming together with different type of either consultancies, um, NGOs, universities. There was yes, a collaboration. Yes. Maura, not meaning to go across you. My point is that unless you have this way of getting these people together, a lot of the time, yeah. like public servants, academics may not understand our issues. And unless they have a particular interest in it, it doesn't start, you know. So I just think maybe ways of getting us together, um, something like this, obviously, but then and maybe in a more regional level, something a bit more closer to home. I don't know. Absolutely. And I think this will be part of the new of the next NRN coming about the next um, CAP network coming about to bring groups together again um, for uh, different operational groups. But at that, we usually like to kind of maybe finish on time that we keep people for the hour um, uh, on our Rural Voices series that we keep people for the hour every time. But I want to most sincerely thank Suzanne. Um, she, as she said, is our partner in the new Premier Project. So we're absolutely delighted as she is our partner in the new Falara project, the female-led innovation in agriculture and rural areas project. So we're delighted to partner with Suzanne uh, across Europe in relation to these two co-creative 
um, innovative uh, multi-actor projects. So we're delighted that. So Suzanne, thank you very much. And again, as she said already, the liaison um, website is still up on site. Please take the links from that we've sent out there. There is an unbelievable amount of material on that website. How to, where to, everything is there. So, and they've spent quite a number of years actually putting all that together. So it's really worth looking into. So thanks to, to Suzanne for that. And again, as Shane said earlier on, we're back at the end of next month with a great talk uh, about rural transport. So we're looking at rural transport next week and uh, we'd be delighted to have you all on board. We'll have the information about that out very, very quickly. So again, please, as we said earlier on, we're tapping into different rural issues every at the end of every month and we're absolutely delighted to have you on board. As always, thanks a lot to Shane Conway who puts a huge amount of work into publicizing the Rural Voices Seminar Series. Uh, Louise Weir, Another one of our researchers uh, in the University of Galway who puts a huge amount of work as well into the background of this. So um, thanks so much to everybody for joining us. We are delighted to have you for the hour at the end of every month. So Goramina Malagat, and uh, thank you all for joining us. And again, thanks. to Thanks a lot for the inv invitation. It was great. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. And thanks for all the questions. It makes a huge difference. Thanks, everyone. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.